Hare Krishna, welcome back. Hare Krishna. So, today we will continue and hopefully conclude our discussion on mythology. <laughs> it has been going on for quite some time. Yeah. And uh, we have a visual here where we can see six aspects which we have discussed or we will discuss now. We basically, our original thrust was to discuss about how much the metaphorical readings of uh, the epics were acceptable or uh, even the word mythology was acceptable or not. And then we discussed the uh, ethical lessons to be learned from it. Then we discussed the historicity, how to look at the historical validation. Then we discussed about the supernatural aspects and how miracles are they against science, but they're not against science, they're about science. Then we discussed metaphorical aspects themselves. Metaphorical is acceptable to the extent it is, it is, it complements the literal. It doesn't replace the literal. It, yeah. uh, then, sorry, supplements the literal, not supplants the literal. And then we discussed, or we're going to discuss today, the conclude that the aspects of entertainment and the aspects of enlightenment. So within an entertainment, broadly speaking, if such stories, uh, if the stories from the epics are sources of entertainment for people, then that's not a bad thing. It could be an entry point that if there are cartoons made of Krishna or if there are cartoons made about Ram, then at least now by the, by the, by the word cartoon, maybe the word cartoon is not the appropriate word, animation say. Yeah, then, that's preferred. Then at least it comes in the mental horizon of the kids. Otherwise, they may not even know about it. I remember I was in America and I was doing a program for youth. And these were all proper, not devotee kids, but Hindu kids. And none of them knew who was Abhimanyu. So I was quite taken aback by that. And these were well-educated in, in good, good American schools. But so I realized that there is no way. In fact, there's one, one movie director with whom we had been talking a while. We were making some documentaries on reincarnation and others. So he said that for the expat community, the main introduction, the expatriates who live in America and the UK, if they want to introduce their kids to Indian culture, the main resource they have is Bollywood. Now, I was thinking whether is Bollywood really introducing them to Indian culture per se. Uh, it could be a very yeah. sensualized aspect, sensualized, romanticized aspect of Indian culture. But then it's talking, there are, there are festivals that are depicted. There is the broad extended family that is depicted, at least in some traditional movies. So, you know, so in that sense, if there is some depiction of the epics, that is good. But then there is, so any thoughts on this? Mm, well, uh, as uh, reading as such uh, goes out of fashion or it is not much emphasized in schools and colleges. So if you ask someone, would you like to read the Mahabharata or would you like to watch the Mahabharata? So the preference is to watch the Mahabharata. Then if the Mahabharata is made with fancy animation, then that is more preferred. So as the attention span shrinks, as uh, more and more products survive for our attention, then obviously people prefer, uh, like have you, have you uh, ever come across the thing that psychologists use like a pacifier? So parents use whatever entertainment is available, like a pacifier. Mm. Okay. And uh, so, so there are a few people who strongly protest that you should give them the whole thing as it is. Like it is said that parents should read the Mahabharata with the kids so that they get the best experience. But that's more like a rarity. But, but what that friend of yours said is correct. That especially for expats, the first introduction is through whatever movies are available. Like mm -hmm. uh, one jarring example, Narad Muni, as any student of Bhagavatam would understand, 
is a highly evolved and a most respectable preacher of bhagavat message as far as shrimad bhagavatam is concerned hmm but bollywood prefers to make a caricature of him and so much so that that's the prevalent image of narad muni in almost everybody who sees movies as their primary source of culture so so in that sense uh, like a big disservice yeah that's a challenge because in some ways distorting traditional narratives in, in some way will have a greater appeal then people who say oh this is the same thing i have heard so many times i have watched so many times i want something new so i think there are three distinct aspects to this one is uh, innovation with respect to presentation uh, with presentation you ha- you have the special effects the the all the dr- all that goes into making a high class movie hmm? so one is innovation with respect to that second is innovation with respect to the story itself changing the story and third is innovation with respect to analysis of the story that means the same story you could just you know, shift the angle a little bit and then the same character who would appear to be like a villain could appear like a hero in yeah. fact nowadays the epic nowadays many of the modern movies they prefer moral complexity they say black and white is this is a hero and this is a villain that's too simplistic so so then i would say that with respect to the first we have no problems at all in fact we would recommend that presentation innovation with respect to presentation when for entertainment it is made so use special effects use the latest of technology in fact i think that is prabhupad's uh, meaning of interpretation of the or prabhupad's explanation of what is realization to present subject in a way that is interesting to the audience mm. so say so we we have innovative presentations that is wonderful then if we have if we have some unknown or unheard unfamiliar interpretations now the word interpretation can have a negative connotation now as long as that interpretation is something which is uh, not contrary to the tradition or something which is maybe makes the traditions wisdom more popular then then that is also acceptable but when some new angles are brought into it which are not actually historically which are not uh, traditionally justifiable then it could become a problem and as far as just discussing you small thing there is a nice nice sentence used by i don't know who said that he said as long as it doesn't pollute the conclusion beautiful as long as it doesn't pollute the conclusion now as far as the story is concerned there is um, uh, there was a group uh, there is a certain amount of artistic license that is available whenever any narrative is to be depicted so for example uh, when we perform a drama whether it's a drama of sudama krishna or whoever else whatever we take it now everything that those characters say would not literally be necessarily what is said in the scripture because when you want to build a drama you have to in english the word is flesh out you have to flesh out the characters and the story so in our tradition also there is there is, rupa goswami has commented on and he has himself written a book called natak chandrika and there he he he's broadly drawn out rules that can be used for or guidelines can be used for uh for dramaturgy for depicting dramas so now if you consider there is a chaitanya chandrodaya natak which is uh, written by kavi karnapur and it depicts kali it actually in a sense represents the whole story of chaitanya mahaprabhu's life as various ways in which kali is attacking lord chaitanya oh and how so for example when chaitanya mahaprabhu wins over keshav kashmiri hmm? so that is shown as kali attacking him through pride but he resists that then when he goes to bangla he goes to um, go travels out of bengal he goes to bangladesh and those parts of the world on a, on a preaching tour and is victorious so he is given a lot of dakshina so that is kali acting attacking him through 
through greed then when he is married to a beautiful wife once twice that is kali attacking him to through lust and he is actually de- depicting a conversation between kali and lust anger greed envy pride they all kali sends them to attack and then kali is frustrated because lord chaitanya is not affected by them at all oh so now the point here is that actually in this discussion uh, so he talks about three kinds of characters over there he says aitihasik kalpanik and aitihasik kalpanik that means when you have to do drama it can be based on fully historical characters it can be based on historical characters and uh, the word kalpanik is imaginary now more we somehow we have a negative connotation with the word imaginary imaginary means not real but you know the word imaginary imagination also has a positivity associated with it you know that's like there's rich imagination in the depiction of this so so it's not we could use the word non uh, we could have non historical so there are there are scriptural characters and the non historical characters so non historical and scriptural can interact with each other in and sometimes there can be just non historical characters entirely so there is a tradition which allows this kind of things you know when uh, prishila prabhupad departs from the world so based on that tamal krishna maharaj has written a book called prabhupad antelila and yes. you know there is a, there it is a depiction of between bhakti devi and other characters in vrindavan how they are churning how they are orchestrating events in such a way that so that there is a there is a, like a conversation between bhakti devi and other bhakti devi and other characters in the bhakti tradition and they are discussing how events in the uh, life of shri prabhupada's last days are are playing out so that the bhakti in the hearts of his disciples will be churned to the maximum so now is this was the malgashama was was this is like visualization did you see bhakti devi doing this he said no this is based on that <laughs> so he says that he, uh, that this is his, he, this is a very good introduction and there he says this is this is done in the tradition so in our tv mahabharat in india hmm. they had used uh, mai kal hu i am time yeah so so he would introduce uh, concepts he would explain things he would analyze so every episode would begin with some analysis so sanskrit uh, natak uh, drama science or whatever natya shastra has something called omniscient observer yes so throughout the performance this character can come on stage and uh, sometimes the the stage curtains are drawn and he comes out and explains to the audience hmm. and then he goes away and then the curtains part and then the next episode begins so yeah, yeah. that is like one device of introducing <clears throat> the main thing to the audience that's true and <clears throat> if you look at the depictions also so so this i was talking about um, how interpretive devices could be used for explaining things but uh, taking it further the point is that uh, among these things that presentation is fine interpretation and uh, you could say re- rendition of the story storyline story itself so if it's only a fleshing out like embellishing of the story then that is fine as long as it doesn't contradict the original storyline and if we consider um, at least to my knowledge among the various depictions that have been done in the mainstream uh, of the in- indian epics i think the original ramayan which was done by uh, ramanand sagar which is recently rebroadcast that has been the most popular there, yeah. there was mahabharat done after that then there was jayavir hanuman and so many other things done but none of them really caught as much the attention or the ima- uh, caught the uh, caught the watching public as much as the original one and one character of the original one was that it was it kept the devotional mood very much there so here <clears throat> now we may not necessarily say that uh, <clears throat> the makers were uh, were purely in a tradition explaining things but still to some extent within the tradition it also it is said that you know hearing the epics from those who are devoted is has special potency to it so yeah. i think that can take us to the last part of the enlightenment aspect do you want to add something i just more? have i just i have a small point about entertainment yeah. 
uh, one positive and one otherwise. So positive is even Western observers who have come to Braj and uh, they have like a few real, really good scholars have shown interest in life in Braj, Krishna's Vrindavan or Krishna's Braj. And they have always mentioned uh, the performance of Rasa Leela. Now, people don't have really an idea. Rasa Leela doesn't mean only Krishna and Gopis dancing. Rasa Leela could be so many pastimes. Mm. And there, they have seen young boys. Uh, many times it is boys who are dressed as both Radha and Krishna. Yeah. So that, that sanctity is maintained. And after the performance, the entire crowd comes and touches the feet of the performers. So they are so immersed. As such, it is Braja Leela. They are in Vrindavan. So their lives are kind of immersed in Krishna Leela all throughout. And then there is this reverential feeling. So psychologists or social observers or etologists, they are quick to understand that even though there is so much of social media and TV and other things, these things like we are just talking from a clearly entertainment point of view, but this thing is understood as going beyond entertainment. Now the uh, other point was when Prabhupada started encouraging devotees to chant Hare Krishna and many, many devotees had hippie backgrounds and hippies were associated with marijuana hashish culture. So one very opportunistic Indian Bollywood film director decided to use that to cash on. And then the famous uh, Dham Maru Dham kind of music that yeah. all that Hare Krishna was doing was only Dham Maru Dham. And of course, later he came to Prabhupada and apologized. And of course, Prabhupada, seeing from his angle, said that, no, no, no. He's, he has at least in this occasion, Prabhupada used the adage that uh, uh, there's nothing like bad publicity. Any publicity is good publicity. But still, for decades, uh, like when I joined the movement, one uh, acquaintance of ours asked my father that, you know, does he do the dumb or dumb thing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the same thing happened with me also. It was probably, I joined probably 10 years <laughs> after you. 10 to, yeah, but still. So, so cultural stereotypes do persist, in, persist across time. Once something goes into the people. And, and we also should know the power of uh, entertainment uh, the business today. How much it has to, uh, it can kind of embed like embedding a software, it can embed some ideas in people's minds and then it is hard to take them away from that. Yeah, yes. we'll move on. Yeah, so now just one, one, one point over here or one response to both points that, yeah, that with respect to that, there is this uh, with respect to uh, Ram Leela, you know, there are, I read once one book on academic book on Hinduism where the, it was talk about living Hinduism. So they had this interview, this boy who becomes a, who becomes Ram. Mm -hmm. so, like we have Ras Leela in Vrindavan, they have Ram Leela in Ayodhya. And it's quite a big tradition over there. So then even in Varanasi it is there. So, the, so it was showed that the boy's father comes and touches his feet when he is acting as, when he is depicting Ram. Now that is quite uh, radical in a traditional culture. So then they were asked, why do you do this? He says, because the, their understanding is, now I'm correct. He says that, no, when he is depicting that particular character, he is no longer my son. Mm. So the idea is they, especially often they perform some puja to start the, uh, start the drama. And through that puja, there are, uh, I read a book on deity worship, uh, again, an academic book. So there they had this idea that uh, for that period, it is as if that character enters into the, uh, that spiritual character enters into the person who is depicting. And it's, it's some way like Avesh, we, we have the word Avesh in our tradition. So yeah. in that sense, uh, they have the idea that 
that's why this it, it is no longer my son that i am respecting it is ram that i am respecting so we talk about deity worship in various ways normally we talk we, we talk only about how we invoke the deity and then that the the stone image we consider that as manifestation of god but there are various levels of invocation like we have ganesh puja so in it it is called as asthai uh, prana pratishtha or asthai they have their word arohan and tirobhav so so but now most hindus or most maharashtrians don't do this but the idea is when you get a image of ganesh from the market before we start worshiping you invoke him and if somebody is not in the position where they can worship that deity for say throughout the throughout the year then worship for a week worship for 10 days worship for 15 days and then before the visarjan you actually to request the deity to depart and then the visarjan is to yeah. be done so something similar like that over there so at the beginning and the end they do the aarti now when chila prabhupad it happened in la that some devotees had gone to rindavan and they saw the the krishna rasthi that we performed over the krishna lila and then they came back and they did a drama and when there were devotees dressed as radha and krishna and everybody else started was told to work, to respect and bow bow down to them and then prabhupada watched the drama but the next morning in the bhagavatam class he he disapproved of that he said don't uh, don't treat the people like radha krishna because what happened was uh, the sahajiyas those are who those who, who take spirituality very at a sentimental level they started exploiting this whole rich tradition devotional tradition for doing illicit activities they would say that we are actually radha krishna and what we are doing when we are imitating the ras lila is actually radha krishna doing through us and that polluted the idea that's why our tradition has been a little cautious about by our tradition is bhakti sanskar takur shila prabhu pada been cautious especially with respect to krishna lila to invoke the idea that the divine manifests over there but that is a part of the tradition yeah yeah and the second point about uh, the depictions i would like your comment on this also see within christianity there have been lot of depictions of jesus say for example the latest one was the passion of the christ was probably the most well known hmm? so now if we look at it from a look at it from orthodox perspective it's not so well known i mean it's not necessarily entirely according to the uh, biblical understanding of jesus of jesus but it has kept to some extent the christ figure or the jesus figure in the in the public eye in the public thought in the cultural imagination mm. and uh, in contrast with that the islamic tradition has the idea that you cannot even depict muhammad uh, depict him basically even through art what to speak of through movies so there is a well known movie on muhammad and and it is all about the activity that he inspired in the, in the whole movie he is not shown at all so <clears throat> you know it's a little dicey so what i'm asking through this is that in today's world of uh, where there is a lot of emphasis on freedom of expression freedom of speech so if we try to legislate or agitate say this is a this is a this is a non bona fide interpretation or this is a malified interpretation this is a depiction that is, that that hurts the religious sentiments or that offends the sacred now often we come out as as right wing extremists so one is with respect to in our own tradition now we would make sure that in our classes in uh, we could say in our podiums our classes and other places we would make sure that things are depicted in a attract in a way that is in harmony with the tradition but in the mainstream when some things are depicted which are not exactly according to the tradition for the purpose of entertainment what would be your idea of how much should we take issue with the whether it is proper or not proper well uh... i won't uh, specifically talk about uh, film media only any presentation like for example a world view of religions so i have seen that some good publishers 
they say that this particular thing which we have printed has been compiled with the assistance or under the supervision of they may say some religious scholars or uh, religious scholars within that tradition yes so that kind of adds authenticity to that so even if sensitive things have to be mentioned uh, every faith will have something which they consider that this has to be done very properly so once you take uh, help of someone within that tradition then at least uh, your goals are clear to everybody that you are not trying to cash on something or you're not trying to mainly what people are fearing is that whether there is an agenda behind doing something and now agenda also has taken a pejorative kind of sense whether somebody wants to malign or somebody wants to make a quick buck so as long as these things are not overtly seen then people seem to have some out of trust in that particular presentation whether it is entertainment oriented or not that is that is not the main point okay so at least some deference to the traditional authority is shown by consulting them and making sure so while preparing itself so that it is yeah. not militantly against uh, traditional depiction i think that is basic human courtesy also isn't it correct if you are depicting a tradition you cannot uh, you cannot just depict it the way you think it is you also have to consider how people who live it see it yeah in fact there has been this is a whole big subject but there has been uh, academic hindu academic study of hinduism is often being depict, accused of depicting hinduism in a way that is quite uh, offensive to the tradition in the hindu tradition hindus and then when when there are some mainstream hindus in america they objected to such depictions at that time it was uh, they acknowledged when, when this was depicted they acknowledged that you know it, when we wrote this there was no uh, there was no uh, how should you put it there was no voice of the tradition that was intelligible to the academia that means there was nobody from the tradition who would discourse mm -hmm. with us who would dialogue with us because traditionalists will present everything in a very traditional perspective alone and that is not very suited for us so yes i think consulting would be a simple solution and especially if, if something is militantly against the mainstream main understanding then then objection is then objection is reasonably valid but when something are there are some minor differences like prabhupada talk about essentials and details or the principles and the details so with respect to details if there is some artistic license i used then that should be okay but when some core principles are misrepresented then it would become problematic isn't it yeah now that brings us to the last part of enlightening that uh, <clears throat> the purpose of these descriptions uh, of the depictions especially given in scripture now here also we could talk about multiple levels not all the narratives that are given in the sacred texts are directly about about god they may be about the about wise characters so for example the bhagavatam says that in the mahabharata there is a whole story of uh, uh, nil damayanti nil damayanti and that is a story more of more of piety rather than spirituality so even in in scripture it everything may not be explicitly teaching a spiritual lesson and everything need not be depicted based on uh, need, need not be a depiction of the lord itself but krishna in the bhagavad gita says that when he comes and performs his past times the purpose is janma karma chame divyam evam yo vittpata tyaktva deham punar janma naiti maam eti swarjana and then he says bahavo gyana tapasa uh, उंड वर्ड सो दिस नॉलेज 
so krishna's pastimes when they are depicted the purpose is not to be entertained by them but it is to enter into them mam eti so the idea is that this is not just some imaginary depiction but there is a physical there is a material reality and there is a spiritual reality and remembering the past times of krishna and becoming absorbed in those past times is a way to raise one's consciousness from the material reality to the spiritual reality and in that sense these are meant to enlighten so here we are using the word enlighten enlightening as sometimes we use generically like we hear some we have some discussion with someone oh that was enlightening so enlightening can sometimes just mean that a light is shown enlightenment has that root light within it a light was shown on the subject so we could say illuminating but here we are using enlightenment in the sense of to go to the level of light tamasoma jyotirgama that to go from darkness yeah. to light so these past times can actually transport one to the spiritual level of reality and uh, so you know it's not just that they offer us another world view but rather they offer us or they transport us they offer us another world to view and not just to view but to reach so this is considered to be something uh, uh, this is a entirely uh, distinctive or unique characteristic of the past times of the lord where they can not only in terms of uh, not, not in terms of thought or absorption transport us to higher level of reality but actually even transport our souls to a eternal spiritual level of reality and this is the the ultimate purpose why these past times are narrated and this is the ultimate purpose that that those who hear this past time should at least be prompted toward this purpose at least they should be aware of this purpose and they move toward that purpose and that's why gyana tapasa this this past times are not just understood by i just by watching them depicted on movie or something like that these uh, what these narratives puta puta is to become purified so one becomes tapasized uh, by no, the, the fire of knowledge one's consci one's consciousness becomes purified and then one understands this as a higher reality which which we can enter and that entering into that higher reality uh, in a eternal bond of love that is the ultimate purpose not just of hearing these past times but also of life itself any thoughts on this yeah one very important consideration is that uh, say for example somebody is enamored by the life of alexander the great and this person devotes his or her complete time attention energy for understanding how and when alexander took uh, his lessons from aristotle and when did he begin his world conquering journey and what happened and where did he finally took rest where did he finally die so some things could be like even today uh, like last few days there was a discovery that a whole uh, what is it some roman tiles were discovered in some excavation so that puts people into a kind of a trance wow look at it we are looking at a piece of history so somebody understanding the personality of alexander with whatever meager historical records are available then some archaeological records and uh, it is always the endeavor of the biographer to take his audience into that time in the past or whatever like carl sandberg who wrote who is lincoln's biographer wanted people to actually be a part of lincoln's history when you read that biography now there is a slight issue with this but what is that issue that from the scriptural point of view that spirit soul who was alexander has already gone somewhere mm. he is no longer uh, he is no longer accessible as alexander and he may not even know that he was alexander so many things could have happened in the third canto second chapter when vidura asks uddhava could you tell me something about krishna so there it is explained that this kind of inquiry immediately made 
such a pure enlightened soul like uddhava go to the spiritual world and mm. then he came back and there it is explained that just like the sun right now we are approaching 7:45 pm uh half an hour ago it was 7:45 pm to the east of india and half an hour afterwards it would be 7:45 pm to somewhere in the west of india but 7:45 will be there throughout so just like the sun is able to maintain its presence whether it is day or night all over the world similarly krishna or rama they are not so called historical personalities so when you read bhagavad gita we talked about how vedic knowledge is state specific your state decides whether you understand it or not so given the right tools and our previous example of somebody having a entry card in a massive uh, office come manufacturing facility like our intel example in arizona phoenix so if you are the ceo then your card will make every door open for you you can go to the labs you can go to the washroom you can go to the office everywhere but if you are just a front of the receptionist your access is denied so when you have someone like uddhav or his representative then you say you read bhagavad gita you are immediately connected to this particular event happening in some other universe the bhagavatam is very clear on that and that makes it fresh so like the father touching the feet of his son thinking that you know lord ram's past times are being enumerated or being exhibited here he is his son at the same time he wants to see him as ram it is possible because ram also is eternal and the past times of ramayana are going on eternal hmm yeah i think this is a categorical difference and that is something which uh, has to be understood more in terms of the nature of the character who is being depicted so the, yes. the character is actually it's a divinity who is being depicted it's not just some historical character and uh, the so we could say that now if we go back to everything that we have discussed there is the ethical we we discussed about the the ethical lessons to be learned the historiography historiography associated with it then the metaphorical non metaphorical then we discussed about the entertainment then we discussed about the supernatural aspect and the entertaining and the enlightening so in some ways could we say that the first five that somebody who, who those who themselves are not spiritually evolved or those who are not enlightened they could also analyze and study this and come up with something useful but yes, yes. the last part is something which only those who are themselves enlightened can provide correct so that means uh, we don't have to have a black and white idea that that nobody can engage with the tradition or engage with these narratives if they are not pure but if we are coming to the uh, tradition for primarily the purpose of enlightenment then we need to know whom we should go to so yeah. if we want to if we want to not just get this get a generic sentiment of krishna bhakti or ram bhakti but actually become spiritually transformed by it actually become deeply attracted to the lord and become detached from the world then we just watching some tv depictions of rama and will not help we have to go to the traditional commentators the traditional te- or the contemporary teachers who are coming in a living tradition and learn from them only through that we will get enlightenment otherwise this will become simply like a pious form of entertainment so somebody might watch some bollywood movies to be entertained and somebody might watch some rama and mahabharat to be entertained and in, it's better that they, they are watching rama and mahabharat instead of bollywood movies but still it is still just a pious form of entertainment it is not necessarily leading to enlightenment and the real mistake or the real serious problem would be if people think that when they are being entertained they are also getting enlightened 
or those yeah. who are so they think I, I don't need to go to the tradition i know everything about it so then it so so for many people the remaining category of analysis ethical entertaining metaphor metaphorical supernatural all that analysis if it become if it acts like a bridge say if this is the level of non engagement with tradition or no uh, no awareness no engagement with the with the scriptural narratives and the, these any of these become ways of engaging with the narratives and then from there they come to the level of enlightenment then at least there is some engagement which makes them receptive to enlightenment but if they start thinking that this is all that is there to the tradition and there's nothing more required then uh, then it could be if it is a stepping stone towards enlightenment that is good but if it is seen as a as equivalent as as if there is nothing more to be got from the engagement with this narrative then it would be a problem isn't it yes so any other like to summarize uh, i think no, well, yeah. i think we have covered pretty much so actually this subject went on uh, kind of uh, expanding on its own <laughs> yes <laughs> that's true so today we discussed primarily about the entertaining aspects and the uh, enlightenment aspect so entertainment aspect it uh, discuss that may, that it is good that through the mainstream media if uh, it is available the scriptural narratives are available so that at least people have some awareness of them now when such uh, depictions are done we discuss there could be innovation in uh, in presentation innovation in interpretation and innovation in the narration itself in the narrative itself so innovation in presentation is something which is wonderful is is necessary but with respect to the interpret the with respect to the uh, retell with the interpretation or the rendition of the story there has to be some amount of caution because now with respect to drama artistic license is there and uh, some of the characters can be fleshed out there can be embellishment but if there is a agenda to misrepresent or to promote a particular ideology using these characters and that is unhealthy so those who are interpreting such things those who are depicting such things it's good that they consult some living teachers of the tradition and then <clears throat> we discussed about the enlightenment aspect that these past times are actually meant to, especially the past times of the lord they are meant to take us to a higher level of consciousness and they transport us not just in terms of our thoughts and absorption but ultimately to spiritual level of reality and that will come only through those who are devoted themselves so the enlightenment is the, what these are offering not just another world to another, it's not another world view but it's actually another world to view and another world to enter into ultimately and if the various approaches to scripture open us ultimately to enlightenment then that's healthy so whether whether people use the word mytho mythology or not that's not the important thing but if it opens them to an enlightenment that's good but if they is stay stuck with the other understanding and think that enlightenment is not at all a concern or not required or they start downplaying or denying or deriding enlightenment then it could become a serious problem but overall there could be a healthy engagement from multiple aspects with the with these narratives that are called mythological Uh, and if we know that enlightenment can be got only from the enlightened teachers then the other engagements can be encouraged say scientists do some more research to verify the historicity of of the epics that's good and these scientists may not be devoted but if they do the research and find out that kind of engagement with the tradition is good but that will not lead necessarily to enlightenment so when we understand the purpose and in that purpose we are in, with that purpose in mind we engage then there could be the tradition stays alive to the extent people engage with it isn't it yeah so thank you very much this has been thank a wonderful you. discussion hare thank krishna you. hare krishna